Hello, and welcome to the next part in our chapter a day series, working through the book of Genesis. Recently, we've been working through the story of Joseph, how God gave Joseph a vision, a dream of something that he was going to be called to do, of a position of significance and importance that would play a part in the overall promise that God was giving to his family that he had originally given to Abraham and that he had given again to Isaac and to Jacob and that Joseph would be a part of this. And we're seeing how this is all coming about in God's perfect timing. So we find ourselves today in chapter 42. In the last chapter, Joseph was taken at the perfect time out of prison where he was awaiting death brought before Pharaoh, and now placed in a position of great importance in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself, as Joseph is responsible for preparing for, a year, for seven years of famine. Seven years of famine that will be coming both to Egypt and to the lands round about. And through Joseph's ingenuity, through God strengthening and equipping him, Joseph prepares Egypt for the famine to come. So that when the famine hits and crops are devastated and the people are hungry, there is food for them in Egypt, thanks to the work of Joseph. And this is where we find ourselves at the beginning of chapter 42. When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Joseph did not send Benjamin, pardon me, Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. So the famine that has come to Egypt has also impacted the land of Canaan. And Jacob turns to his family and says, what are you looking at each other for? They're trying to decide what to do about this horrendous famine. And Jacob says, look, I've heard that down in Egypt there's food. So I want you to go to Egypt, he says to his sons, go down to Egypt and I want you to buy food there so that we don't perish. And we're told that Jacob sends ten of his sons. Now we know from previous chapters that Jacob had twelve sons. Joseph was one of the twelve, born from Rachel, his favored wife. And Benjamin was one of the twelve, born from Rachel just before she died. So we're told that Jacob sends ten of his sons down to Egypt. Joseph, who is already in Egypt, that Jacob thinks was killed more than three decades ago by a wild animal, isn't here. And Benjamin who is Rachel's other son, we're told that Jacob won't send Benjamin, even though Benjamin is, is a grown man as well, won't send him. Why? Because he is fearful harm might come to him. Again, we see a picture of the unhealthy family dynamics here between Jacob and his children. Because Jacob is willing for the sake of finding food, to send his other ten sons away to Egypt, even though it is a dangerous journey and harm may befall them. But he won't send... He won't send Benjamin because he doesn't want anything to happen to him. So Benjamin has taken on a favored position here. 
similar to the position Joseph has. So Benjamin stays home. The other 10 brothers head off to Egypt to buy food with many other people who are coming to the land of Egypt hoping to find food there. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. So here is this moment. This moment which goes back, all the way back to Joseph's dreams. The ten sons of Jacob come to Egypt. They arrive there, and there present in Egypt is Joseph. Joseph is the governor of Egypt. As we heard in the previous chapter, Joseph is responsible for food distribution. So all these people, both Egyptians and non-Egyptians, have to go through he and his assistants in order to purchase food. So we have Joseph's brothers come, and the person they have to deal with is Joseph, and in proper respect for a governor of Egypt, these men come and bow down before their brother. I also want you to catch the symbolism here. They are coming to buy grain. They are coming to buy food. So here they come seeking food for the purposes of gathering grain for themselves. And now in the presence of Joseph, they bow down. This ties back to the first dream. Remember, we were cutting sheaves, harvesting sheaves in the, of wheat in the field. Mine rose up and all yours bowed down around it. We see the symbolism being fulfilled as now they come to buy grain and they bow down before Joseph, governor of Egypt. And what we see next is important because this is displaying important aspects of human and divine character. Verse 7, Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where did you come from, he said. They said, from the land of Canaan, to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. They said to him, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. He said to them, No, it is the nakedness of the land you have come to see. And they said, We, your servants, are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in you. Or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all together in custody for three days. So we have this interesting moment here. Joseph recognizes his brothers. But his brothers don't recognize him. So as far as the brothers can see, and think that here is Joseph who is living in Egypt. He's dressed in, 
Egyptian garments. He's probably wearing some of the, the makeup and facial appearance of an Egyptian. He's part of their culture. He looks very different. And remember, they are not expecting to see the brother they sold off into slavery, expecting that he's probably long dead by now, worked to death. They're not looking for Joseph as the governor of Egypt. So they don't see him for who he is. And Joseph begins to test them. He is seeking to determine their character. Have they grown or changed since the day they took him and sold him into slavery. So he prepares a character test. And the character test involves their hearts. So he accuses them of being spies. He said, you've come to the land to spy us out, to see our strengths, to see our weaknesses, to see where we're most helpless, to see us as if we were naked. They say, no, we're not. We're not a group of spies. We're actually brothers. Joseph again accuses them of spying, and they say, no, we are brothers. That There were 12 of us originally. The youngest is home with his father. The other one is no more. And Joseph says to them, I am not going to believe you until you can bring your youngest brother to me. So I'm going to put you in prison to consider this. And for three days they sit confined in prison. On the third day, verse 18, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody, and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine in your households. And bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us, and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. So what we hear from the brothers, is the brothers look at the situation, we begin to see the state of the brothers' hearts. It has been... If we take into account the fact that Joseph was 17 when he was sold into slavery, that he was 30 when he was taken out of prison, that seven years have passed, the seven good years, and now we're into the years of famine, if even only we're only a year or two into the years of famine, that would make Joseph close to 40 years old. That means estimating that it has been more than 20 years since Joseph was sold into slavery. And as soon as this difficulty comes upon them, the first thing the brothers say is, they are guilty. of their crime against Joseph. For over 20 years, this has not left his brother's minds. What they did to Joseph, they feel the weight of. Reuben talks about how he tried to stand up for Joseph to the, to the other brothers. Remember when I told you not to harm him. Now this is our reckoning. 
And then we see in verse 23, they did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them and wept, because Joseph sees that there's something in his brothers. There is a conviction of sin at work in his brothers. There is a softening of the heart at work in his brothers. That which they did in a moment out of their hatred for him has brought about shame and guilt. They feel what they did to their brother. And Joseph is overwhelmed by this as he sees this. And he returned to them and spoke to them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. And Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to replace every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. This was done for them. Then they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed. As one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of his sack. He said to his brothers, My money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. At this their hearts failed them, and they turned trembling to one another. What is this that God has done to us? So we have the next part of the test. We see that Simeon Simeon is in jail. He's the hostage to see if they will come back and bring their younger brother. We see that their money is returned. So they got all this food, but it cost them nothing. And now they're petrified, and they know that somehow this is the Lord at work. It's like, what is the Lord doing? We've been threatened by the governor in Egypt. Our brother's been imprisoned. We have to bring our younger brother back to get him out. And yet, everything we brought to pay for food has been given back to us. Everything seems to be off kilter for them. Verse 29. When they came to Jacob their father in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke roughly to us and took us to be spies of the land. But we said to him, We are honest men. We have never been spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father, one is no more, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I shall know you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me, and take the grain for the famine of your households, and go on your way. Bring your youngest brother to me. Then I shall know you are not spies, but honest men. And I will deliver your brother to you, and you shall trade in the land." As they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more. And now you would take Benjamin. All this has come against me. Then Reuben said to his father, Kill my two sons. I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. But Jacob said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. Now we've had a picture of Joseph's heart as he wants to test his brothers but at the same time as he hears them confess their sin we see his brokenness 
We see what is happening in the lives and the hearts of the brothers. But then we get a picture of Jacob as well. And we see sort of the weakness of Jacob. When Jacob hears the story, Jacob dismisses Simeon is dead. It's like, I lost Joseph, now I've lost Simeon. There's no way you're taking Benjamin. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And then Reuben steps up with this great offer. He says, look, you can take my two sons. You can kill my two sons if I don't bring you back. Benjamin. I am going to put him so much in my care that I am sure I'm going to bring him back. But if you need a guarantee, you can take my, the life of my two sons. They become yours to kill if you wish. So we see something here. We see Reuben and his desire both for the sake of Simeon, his brother, but also to give protection to Benjamin, who is the new favorite he makes this bold offer. And yet, then we see Jacob. We still see the humanity and the weakness of Jacob. Because he says, Benjamin's the only one left. Here's all these brothers standing there. There are nine brothers present with him, wanting their father to help them so they can get another one of their brothers home. And the words of his father is, Benjamin's the only one I have left. Now, of course, he's linking that back to he's the only one, the only connection he has of his favorite wife, Rachel. But imagine what that's saying to the brothers. He's basically said, Simeon doesn't matter. He's gone. Too bad for Simeon. The rest of you doesn't matter. All that matters is Benjamin. If something happened to Benjamin, I would, I would go to the grave in mourning. There would be nothing left for me. There's a lot happening in this chapter as we wrap up. We see changes of heart, yet we see hearts that have not changed. We see a change of heart among the brothers that we don't see in Jacob. We see Joseph in a position of power, to take revenge, and rather than take revenge on his brothers, we see him testing their character. He wants to know their hearts, and as he begins to get a glimpse of their hearts, we see how it affects him, that he weeps as he hears them, as he hears them recount what they did to him more than 20 years before, and how they expect punishment. They expect reckoning from God. So much here for us. Where are we among the characters here? Are we with Joseph, who seeing his brothers and the human tendency, he had all the power to bring about revenge. He could have ordered these foreigners killed and they would have been. He could have simply had them imprisoned and left there as he had been left in prison for so long, waiting to die. But we don't see that. Instead, we see the test, a test of character. Joseph wants to know, has his brothers changed? We see a glimpse into the hearts of the brothers, and we see that something is at work. There is something at work. We see that as we see Reuben and Reuben's willingness to risk all for the sake of a brother, for the sake of his brothers. Is that where our heart is, softened, contrite, recognizing our sin and our need to address it? Or are we like Jacob, who's blind? Jacob, who doesn't see, who doesn't realize what his selfishness and his favoritism and his preference is doing? There's a lot to consider here as we continue on this journey. I hope it gives you lots to reflect on. I hope it gives you things to, to pray about and even examine yourself. Joseph, his brothers, or Jacob? 
in each area of your life, where do you find yourself? Consider that before the Lord. Meditate on it, think about it. Ask the Lord to show you, are you blind to what is happening around you? Is your heart being softened and changed? Are you able to seek the truth or is anger and revenge ruling you? These are the important things to consider. If this gives you good food for thought, please share it with somebody else. And as always, thank you and God bless you.